say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two-lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride. Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America. Good morning, my friends. It's another wonderful day here in Jim Hinckley's America. In Kingman, Arizona, it's 50 degrees. Tad bit windy. It's supposed to be uh, sunshine today. Personally, I don't know how much this person can take sunshine and warm weather day after day. It's, it's like a curse. On a serious note, we definitely need some rain today. Uh, talking about road trips to this today with a Denny Gibson friend and us, an associate I've known for a few years. So it's fitting we have a little music from the road crew to talk about road trips. Hey, Mr. Denny Gibson, how are you this morning? Doing great, Jim. Uh, I hope I'm coming through. Yeah, we got you here. Super. You know, this technology stuff just fascinates the daylights out of me. How it can work. You know your book, uh, Tracing a T to Tampa. The thing with a Model T Ford is it worked or it didn't work, but you knew why, and it gave you some warning. This technology stuff, it works now. Five minutes from now, it doesn't for no apparent reason. Right. On T's, you could actually see the parts, and when they broke, they <laughs> usually could see that too. There's two things I find about modern technology. Uh, I wouldn't want to, first of all, go back to writing on a typewriter, writing books and things. But technology, I find two advantages. I try to find a silver lining in everything. Number one, trying to do things like this podcast, I never have to look for an excuse to drink. And number two, it gives me added incentive to think of becoming an Amish farmer as a career move. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, I always enjoy your books, but this one, uh, it was great, first of all, to see you at the Miles of Possibilities Conference. I don't yeah, think good conversations there, Jim. Enjoyed that. Yeah, I always enjoy that event, and it's always good to visit. There's never enough time for a one-on-one -on -one visit. That's the problem. Oh, yeah. I got to tell you, though, of all the books you've done, this one really struck a chord, Tracing a T to Tampa. Uh how exciting, how fascinating to try to find, follow along in your great-grandparents' footsteps. And I was really surprised that you found so many locations in spite of their vague descriptions. How many of those places still exist? Uh, surprisingly, I don't know. I was going to say surprisingly uh, quite a few. Uh, of course, there wasn't that many. There's a lot, lot more that are gone. Uh, but... Uh, I was surprised at that, uh, found some that she specifically identified, you know, for example, you probably read a thing about the sugar mill. That one uh, really kind of excited me, a couple hundred years old, uh, and a few other places, some bridges and things. But, uh, of course, most of the businesses are gone. Oh, the sugar mill, that was another episode, uh, the, the language. I was really glad uh, at, uh, that you included the letters verbatim you know a verbatim and uh a lot of people would shy away from using some of the language that our ancestors used and well, i'm glad I'm you i'm, I'm glad you didn't i was certainly uh inclined to shy away from some of that but it, it was it was uh used in the day no uh, no question there so uh <laughs> keep it precise and as you you probably guessed that that book is different for a couple reasons it's uh uh, more personal because it's family. And I did it kind of for the family. Um, you know, a lot of people are still around that knew, uh, knew that couple, grant my great, great grandparents. And, uh, so part of the goal was to, uh, get that stuff saved where it was distributable and get it out to family members. So that put an extra kind of twist on it too. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you have the the, 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 in, uh, the intricacies of a Model T. You haven't quite mastered that yet. Well, the the, the, <laughs> the transmission. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I actually uh, 
after writing about teas a little bit, I thought, you know, I really ought to uh, try this. So I did go up in, uh, in Pennsylvania last year and, and, and drove a few. There's, they run a little class up there at one of the museums. And uh, so I, driving it, uh, I, I've got figured out. But the way that transmission works, I've, I've looked at diagrams. I've spun my fingers in the air and twisted my fist around. Uh, it just, just doesn't click with me. No, you know, they were, God, they were amazing automobiles uh, as far as uh, simplicity. Mm. I, I don't think you could make a car any more simplistic than a Model T Ford. Once you figure out the the unique nature of trying to operate the transmission and the, the throttle on the steering column, one, once you have that figured out, uh, they're just ridiculously simple automobiles. Oh, they are. Yeah, I was uh, talking about the throttle. I was surprised when I when I drove them. Uh, I had always assumed it was kind of like a lawn tractor, and you set the throttle and just you know went around and and uh, didn't touch it. But uh, it's actually uh, just about as active as uh, you know our our foot pedals today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a challenge, but it's uh, entertaining. When my wife and I were courting forty plus years ago, I. I had a 26 uh, Ford touring car we used for double dating. I kept in Kingman. And uh, your your stories here reminded me so much of that. Uh, this, this particular tea had been sitting behind a dairy farm since the 50s. And there was no top and no upholstery. It was just <laughs> just literally springs. But I, I kept a roll of foam and uh, indoor-outdoor carpet I could put on the seats before I'd go pick up my date. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, such a romantic yeah this book oh and it's interesting too that you chose to take your your trip during the era of the apocalypse to do this well that uh, wasn't a choice a free choice no. that was the, the anniversary you know that was a hundred right. anniversary but you what i'm saying is you didn't let the apocalypse slow you down too much no but i was certainly prepared for it um that was the only trip of any length that year and I said, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to start on that day, but I was prepared to uh, postpone the rest of the trip if I really ran into trouble. Or uh, at that time, the possibility of, you know, out-of-state travel being shut down existed. So I was, that was in the back of my mind, but uh, turned out that didn't happen. Uh, and as I've said, the, uh, you know, recently, all the motels were empty and half of the restaurants were closed, but... Uh, you can get through. Ah, perseverance. That is key to any road trip. And, and you've had a few. Another one, some of the, the letters I found really fascinating, uh, like uh, driving an open Model T touring car. And Frank is so cold, he had to stop and warm. It was 18 degrees above this morning. <laughs> I, you know, I... I I consider myself kind of a, a little bit more rugged than the average modern traveler. And I get a little fussy if there's not enough hot water to shave and take a shower. <laughs> but, but we, I mean, what these people took as normal at that time is right. uh, kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, they, uh, you, you probably know later on where they, uh, I guess whatever coming home, they would drain the radiators at night when they were camping. But of course they had no antifreeze. Freeze. And then they would sometimes have to tow the cars, uh, tow each other to get started in the morning. It's a different time. I, uh, I had the privilege a few years ago to uh, assist the Historic Vehicle Association. And they recreated Edsel Ford's trip of 1915 mm -hmm. yep. to California along the National Old Trails Road. And they followed as much of the original road as they could. And I've got to tell you, I'd have to do some serious drinking to take my Jeep, the places they took that Model T in the desert. Uh, but uh, they gave me a copy of Edsel Ford's travel journal. And uh, God, not only, not only draining the radiators at night, but they would build a small fire under the car in the mornings to heat the oil. <laughs> yeah you know i mean who, who, who even thinks of building a fire under your car in the morning that <laughs> that that sounds a little touchy but 
Uh, this, how many books have you written now, Denny? Um, to- total of seven. They're all travel logs. Uh, and I sometimes get, uh, I don't know, beat up, but people, they are not guidebooks. And sometimes, despite me trying to, uh, be as upfront about that as I can, I sometimes uh, get a little static, but they, that's what they are. They're, they're, they uh, tell of my trip on these places. It doesn't, uh, try to plan out your trip for you you know it's it's just a story i will mention um yeah you had you had said something about this being my latest book it's actually not there's one since then oh okay uh with a uh, goofy name called uh uh what 20 and 21 and the yt2 uh across the country twice once uh on you historic us 20 and then the other direction on the yellowstone trail so that that was in 21 okay and then i've stopped Ah, I'm getting behind here on my collection. Uh, uh, Maggie wanted uh, Maggie May. She's from Michigan with the uh, R.E. Olds Museum. And right. she, mentioned, she mentions the Gilmore Museum in Michigan has Model T driving classes. I know. Uh, uh, well, I they, I guess they have them back now. At, the, at that time, uh, they were, uh, weren't having. I, that's the first place I looked at when I wanted to do that. And uh, they were old, I guess, uh, probably leftover from the pandemic uh so the uh, place in pennsylvania was the uh, only one i could find i also tried there's a uh, model t museum closer to me in richmond indiana oh uh, and i thought that one time they did uh, uh driving things but uh i called them and they said the guy i talked to said no so i don't know whether that was miscommunication uh they were on hold or what but uh that wasn't happening either Two of the things that uh, Model A's and Model T's, a couple of things that really amaze me about those cars, even today, is the owners. Uh, You know, people will own these beautiful Packards and Hudsons that are road cars that you can get out on the highway. Even in a 1916 Hudson, you can get out and go. But people who have these cars, Hudsons, uh, DeSotos, Chryslers, they won't drive them. They trailer them or they have to street rod them. But yet people with Model A's and Model T's think absolutely nothing about getting together with their friends on a whim and driving to Alaska. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, I admire that. Oh, I do too. You know, I hope I don't offend anyone, but I got to share this. And I'll tell you why. There's one one part of the book, one section in your great-grandparents' letters. Uh, You mentioned the cane mill. And it says, we've just returned from the cane mill. We took some pictures of the mill and also of the coons. They were very nice people. They are Methodist. I found that personal, uh, really personal. My my, uh, Ma's family down on Sand Mountain, Alabama, uh, that is exactly how my Aunt Violet talked. Word for word, she, she, she was the sweetest, kindest person you ever met. But she had no problem, even into the early 90s, using the N-word or the coons or whatever the term may be. And and she'd always pepper it with, but they were Methodist. They were nice. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because that's they had two strikes against them for yeah. being Methodist. <laughs> well, I, I on that language and so forth, that was, of course, the way they talk. And, I, and I'll, uh, as I say somewhere, I don't, I don't know in the book about it, um, they weren't granny in particular. She writes that, and I'm sure she uh, she was prejudiced. Uh, she considered them uh, uh, I don't know so, somewhere uh, less than her, but she meant no harm to anybody. You know, it was, yeah. it was uh, uh, kind of a, a strange situation, and uh, trying to cleanse those letters would have been a, a tough tough thing. Not that they're uh, you know that those words appear everywhere, but they do appear, and they uh, uh, it w- it just would have made it different. You know? Well, I found it refreshing, and I'll tell you why is because cleansing history is no good when you do it this way, and it's accurate. It becomes a milestone on how far we've progressed as a people, yep. and how far and how far we've got to go. But unless you can't really judge these people, you have to put yourself 
you can't look at their world through our eyes today. You have to put yourself in their period. And that doesn't mean they were right or wrong. It just means that they had a different worldview. And you can't understand that if you sterilize it. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you've had some other great adventures, uh, like on the uh, Lincoln Highway. Uh, yeah, I've done the uh, uh, <laughs> done the Lincoln, uh, I guess, end to end. Uh, in one shot, I've only done it end to end once, but I've done a lot of piecemeal and put it together. Uh, that that's a, a great road, great adventure, of course. Uh, and mentioned, I don't want to uh, put you in a bad light because of '66 thing. And six, for '66, or for me, '66 was kind of a uh, a gateway drug, I guess, and got me onto some other things. But uh, I've done it end to end four times. I'm not done any books on it because there, I, I just don't have anything new to say, I guess. But uh, oh, did it. you don't put me in a bad light at all. I'm not myopic. And, I know, uh, oh, I know, Jim. And Route 66, I, I liked, I've heard that before. Route 66 is the gateway drug. It, it, it gets people uh, into the frame of mind to be able to appreciate and enjoy a road trip. And going back to your books, no, they're not a travel guide, but they are road trip inspiration. And, and that right there is priceless to inspire oh, people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What the, and you kind of one of your Lincoln Highway trips? You did it in an older car, correct? I did it. Uh, that one I did end in was a '63 Valiant. It's the first time I've ever, and the only time I've ever done an older car. Um, and I planned that ahead of time. It was going to be a uh, hundred years old. The, the road was going to be a hundred years old. And I thought of doing it in a hundred-year-old car, and I thought that ah, I'm not going to do. I'm not good for that. And so I, I cut that in half and did it in a 50-year-old car. So it was a 63 car in uh, in 03, or in 13, rather. Um, and uh, in getting that car ready, uh, I did some, uh, you know, put an electronic ignition in it. and meant I had to do some timing. And I'm, I'm laying on the floor and getting, I'm doing this by myself. And three or four times getting up off a concrete floor um, convinced me that I'm a little too old for this stuff. <laughs> So uh, the, the car was going after the trip. That's the only one I've done, and I, it's the only one I will do. But, yeah, it's not like, uh, you know, when you're uh, in your teens and working on that old junker in the backyard, uh, bum bouncing up and down is pretty easy. Uh, it's not so easy today. You know, I, I God, I can relate. In my head, I'm still 20, and I go out and spend a half a day working on this 51 Chevy truck, and I almost crawl in the house. <laughs> and I can't stand up for two days and I walk like a question mark. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know, even a car in the sixties and uh, your Valiant, was that a, by the way, was that a slant six? Oh yeah. Slant yeah. six push button. That old slant six was a, was a very, very good motor. Yep. Very good. You know, gosh, darn it. You know, even the cars in the sixties in seventies, even, yeah, they seem so primitive to what we're doing today. And uh, they do require a little bit more work. Right. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the work and the, I'll tell you the things I noticed in driving that car up on a long trip. Uh, Most of it was brakes. Uh, it's amazing what we get used to with, uh, you know, power assisted disc on all, all wheels compared to those old uh, drum brakes that were not only weaker but would heat up uh, uh went through uh the, i remember going through pittsburgh lots of up and downs on the old road and those brakes were fading by the time we got to the end of the day yeah you know at, at the risk of sounding like a name dropper i've i had a visit with jay leno a while back and yeah. we were talking about this on the old cars that uh, the uh, the new cars you steer and you ride in them the old cars you drove and you prayed yeah <laughs> yep yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I've, I've had this obsession for years and I, I better do it soon, but I want to do, uh, 66 in a model a Ford, but, uh, man, I better do that one quick. Yeah. I would, I would like to, to do that. I think, but I, uh, like I say, my, my experience bouncing up on the floor, I don't know that I've got it in me to maintain a car like that for a trip. 
Well, Danny, you know, we could make this a team effort. We'll get us a Model A and we'll we terrorize, yeah. terrorize the countryside and see how much apple pie we can eat. Oh, I can uh, I can do my share of the apple well, pie. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I get to reading, and there again, we mentioned Edsel Ford, your great grandparents. Uh, Edsel Ford's travel journal from 1915. He mentions that they left Williams, Arizona. They were, of course, rich kids. And uh, a couple of his buddies had a new Cadillac V8, and the others had a new Stutz. Ah. And his entry for July 16th, 1915. They left Williams, Arizona that morning and arrived at the Brunswick Hotel in Kingman at midnight. They considered it a good day's run, 156 miles, because they only had two flat tires and broke one spring on the studs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure you knew this anyway, but as that, that goes, um, talking about the tires, uh, I think one of the biggest improvements in cars is the tires. Yes, yes. You know, those guys, uh, we said had, they had two in one day. Uh, grandparents had multiples every, you know, other page, it seems there's a, a flat tire. And uh, I I don't know, and, and you too. I mean, uh, you didn't have any flat tires when you drove from Arizona to Illinois last month. No. Uh, I didn't have any flat tires. I haven't had, uh, you know, it just doesn't happen much anymore. They don't even put spare tires in things anymore. I and when I was a kid growing up, and you probably did this too, uh, we patched a lot of tubes along the highway. Absolutely, yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, Maggie has a tires too. Uh, Maggie has a question: Why would we do a trip like that in the Model A versus a Model T? Well, from my point of view, Mo Model A is one a lot easier to drive, and it's a lot uh, easier to keep up with the traffic in them. Yeah, uh, T. Lindsey Baker, uh, Dr. Baker, that was the Miles of Possibility Conference. He's model. He he's had Model A Fords since he was in high school, and uh, still drives them. And uh, when he did his Route sixty six research trip for his book, he was driving a twenty nine Ford Woody. I know that. That's uh, yeah. I met him at that. Uh, conference. I think you introduced me, in fact, at that conference. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's pretty amazing driving those uh, A's. You had um, Tom Cotter on your, your show here a while back. I listened to that one. Yes. Um, and uh, he did it, uh, did the Lincoln in a Model T, or most of the Lincoln. Yes. Uh, in a T, but that was not your uh, run-of-the-mill Model T. That was pretty highly modified and able to at least get up in the 40s. I, I met a group uh, two years ago, two summers ago. They were from Galveston, Texas. Uh, and they started planning this trip relatively spur of the moment, six months. They had some, they belonged to a model T club. Some of their friends owned model T's and they decided to make a, what they called, uh, uh, the grand adventure. Uh, they set out from Galveston, Texas in March. I met them here in Kingman. They drove over to Tucson, six people in model T Fords. They drove to uh, Tucson. Uh, up to Kingman and then over to California, San Francisco through Death Valley mm. and up the, up the coast. They took a, the ferry up to Alaska and wow. drove and drove back to Texas down the Alcan highway. Oh, wow. uh, the oldest was a 1916 Ford and the newest was a 1925. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that is uh, pretty adventuresome. Yeah, that is. Uh, in fact, I, I, I've just picked or I uh, ordered, Cotter's uh, book on the uh, his grand adventure up through there. Yes, that's something I've always wanted to do. Have you ever been up in that country? The, I did. Uh, Al yep. The uh, that was a um, a lifelong. I think the Alcan was probably the first road when I was I was probably ten years old. Um, somebody my dad worked with had been up there, and he had these home movies, eight millimeter, silent movie kind of things, and they got a bunch of guys together, and we watched these movies. And I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, of course, it was a lot different then. So I had wanted to do the Alcan forever. And so I finally uh, did that in 2016, I guess. A lot different than what those movies showed, but a uh, great trip. Absolutely. Well, it's been on my list for a long time. My problem is the older I get, I've been a desert rat so long. It gets below 80. I look for my long underwear. Yeah. And the longer I'm out here, I'm, 
starting to push that. Now it gets below 85. I start looking for my long underwear. So <laughs> I, I might have some real issues going up there. Yeah, well, there's only, uh, I did it in uh, July. Let's see how they do that. I forget the beginning of uh, end of June, July, somewhere now. It was there the 4th of July anyway. Uh, there's only a couple months that it's pretty normal for me, temperatures, you know. Uh, doesn't get up uh, in the 80s and 90s you might be used to, but it's there's no snow or very, you know, not much. Uh, outside of that, I wouldn't want much to do with it. Do you have any upcoming adventures planned or new pro book projects? Or well, anything? I, don't, I don't know uh, exactly. I mean, not completely planned, but the next uh, one, I've been wanting to do uh, uh, National Old Trails Road end end. I've done the National Road as far as Vandalia, you know, the original. Yeah. Um, and I've done, probably been on all the uh, National Old Trails bits and pieces, but never did it end to end. So that's been on my to-do list. And I actually sort of had that plan for this last year and a lot of other things got in the way. But now I've got more incentive. Uh, you probably remember that uh, Mike Ward used some of your, uh, uh, what, your, your Facebook space or something uh, to... Uh, in one of your conversations, he uploaded the uh, Pikes Peak yes. mm -hmm. version book. Or the, right. And I had never, uh, I think I probably bid on a couple of those and they got away. Uh, so I've never seen the full full path. And that's one that I've wanted to do forever. I've done bits and pieces. And it's going to make a perfect partner for the National Old Trails. Uh, yes. One direction on one and one the other. So I don't have that plotted out, but that's the next uh uh, I hope to get that in next year. I've got the uh, national old trails uh, kind of together uh, plotted, but uh, haven't even started on the Pikes Peak. But that'd make a real, uh, I don't have a date or even, I, you wouldn't call it a plan, but it's uh, in the back of my head. You get out this way, I'll show you some sections of the national old trails road uh, that are really surprisingly still, still drivable, pretty easy to drive with lots of goodies out there. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, You've turned me on to a few things out there, but I will, uh, well, of course, if I, if I do get the National Old Trails, I'll be right in your neighborhood, so uh, we'll make that a date. Sounds good. You know, one of the highways that intrigues me, and I've never, I've driven it, a lot of it in, in sections and pieces, is US-6. Yep. I agree with you. I would, uh, I've also done bits and pieces and, and, uh, and, and like what I've been on, but I've not done it end to end either. It's mostly intact, uh, largely intact, over 90-some percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found out recently, my pa always said, better to fill your head with useless knowledge than no knowledge at all. Uh, I recently found out that uh, US-6 was the last US highway to be fully paved. It wasn't completely paved until 1952. Really? Didn't know that. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an odd highway. It's kind of like... Uh, that, you know where that last piece was? Yeah, at the uh, Nevada Utah line, ah, there was yeah. about f about forty five miles there that was graded gravel until nineteen fifty two. Oh wow! <laughs> it, it's an intriguing highway. I, for us old timers, we remember the uh, uh, Ronald Reagan's anti drug campaign about this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, this yeah, yeah. frying the egg in the skillet thing, right. and. Uh, US six reminds me of a highway designed by people like that on drugs. It, it, <laughs> it seems to go nowhere on purpose. And uh, as far as I know, it's really the only US highway to go north and south, east and west. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it does get around. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it, originally, it went from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all the way to Long Beach, California. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I found out it's the highest U.S. highway crossing Loveland Pass in Colorado. Oh, didn't know and, that. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's intrigued me for, for, for quite some time. Uh, Danny, where can we find your books? Well, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're all self-published. Uh, so they're all on Amazon. That's who I use. Um, the, um, and there's also... Uh, um, listings on eBay for all of them. If okay. uh, you want a signed copy or as, as, uh, as you say, a defaced copy, I can deface books too. Well, 
I got to, you know, I got to tell you how it came about. And I'll, I'll yeah. be brief. Do repeat but, that. I know this. So I think it's great. <laughs> oh, it, it's great. We had a bookstore about three blocks from my house down here at the shopping center. And some years back, they're gone now. Most of the bookstores are, but they had a book signing. And I was really shocked how many people showed up. It was one of the biggest book signings I did. They sold out of books. So I told the manager, I says, why don't we just keep selling the books? And I'll probably, when they come in, I'll sign them for people. I only live a few blocks away. I drive by here every time and you can sell the books. And, uh, I promise I'll sign them for people. And, uh, I never heard from the manager. And so about a week, two weeks later, I walked in the store and I went to the, towards the back, their, the, their information desk. And there was all those books lined up on the shelf. And I says, uh, I'm here to sign these books. Uh, I think they're already sold. It was on their sold shelf. And the lady looked at me, she's just shocked. And she says, well, it's Sunday. We don't have the manager here. You'll have to come back tomorrow. We can't have random people defacing books. <laughs> I think that's one of the greatest lines ever. That's good. Yeah, that's uh, the adventures in writing. Hey, yep. and this, this takes me to another question. Self-publishing. They, uh, Amazon used to have create space. Right. What are they, how does that? How do you do? What are you using now? It's they, they combine that with uh, I, I guess their old Kindle thing, Kindle Direct Publishing. I think KDP is what they call it now, um, and it's kind of a combination of the two. Uh, and I've done both of them. When I do one, I'll do a Kindle version. Uh, you know, yeah, Kindle version too. Um, and uh, it's pretty much the same as it was. Uh, the tools are a little better, I guess. Um, I, I do it. Well, I don't have a publisher. I dig it out. And here's all, uh, um, uh, and I'm not in this to make a living with, and I'm retired and it's a, it's definitely a hobby. So, uh, you know, the, it's not the way to make a living. Uh, I don't, you know, as you know, it's, it's a tough way to make a living anyway. <laughs> and uh, self-publishing doesn't help that. Um, but self-publishing also means self-promotion. And I'm yeah. not particularly good at that. Uh, so, uh, you know, having uh, having the editor and so forth involved. How I started that, uh, are you familiar with a guy named uh, Brian Butko? Mostly the I, I, stuff. No, I know the name, but I, I don't uh, I don't know him, no. He, he's, he's written several books on different things, but uh, Lincoln Highway is kind of his main thing. And uh, actually, it was during that centennial before I'd done, done any books. Uh, I was on a bus tour and sitting next to him, we we're talking, and, and he's... Uh, of course, has a real publisher, and, and he had been looking at Amazon and uh, uh, self-publishing stuff. He never, he's never used it. He keeps publishing real books and, and uh, so forth. Uh, but he mentioned he had looked at that because he says if I if I want to write about something, I have to spend months convincing my publisher that it, it will sell. And he says uh, there's some things I want to write about that probably won't sell. <laughs> He says, I'm looking at that. And I thought if it's good enough for him, I'll take a look at it. And so I did. And that's where the, the, the Lincoln Highway book was the first one I did. Um, and I'm just kind of, you know, stuck with doing that. Like I say, it's, you, you got to do it all yourself. Um, but there's no upfront cost. And uh, the, the final product is, is pretty decent. Uh, so I've, I've just kind of stuck with that. Danny, you know, you, uh, first of all, uh, Maggie asked uh, if you have a website. Uh, sure. Uh, it's a toughie. DennyGibson.com. Uh, and if people are interested, the books there down at the, the bottom of that is a, a link to, uh, there's this imaginary company called uh, uh, Trip Mouse Publishing. And there's a link there to a page. It's got the books and links to Amazon and eBay listed. So that's, that's a nice composite thing. Yeah. Uh, but just let me, uh, is that, that there's two things that I do when I do road trips, I do uh, daily updates while I'm on the road. Uh, that was how the website started. So half of it is journal, half of it's blog. And there's probably some other halves there too, but, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we need to sit down and do this again and have a program and just talk about writing. You mentioned doing this for a living as a hobby. Uh, I started writing in 1990, and for more than 20 years, I had a job that supported my writing habit. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Yeah. I've worked with a lot of publishers and I've come to the conclusion that publishers and editors are a lot like politicians and they have an international uh, component. It's kind of like cleaning stables. It comes in different colors, but it all smells about the same. <laughs> and I have had just the episodes of publishing and writing is just incredible. I sat down with an interview with Jay Leno. I did a book on the checker cab manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay, and Jay mentioned, he said he was probably one of the five people who bought a copy. Yeah. And I said, no, you're one of the seven people who bought a copy <laughs> of that particular book. Yeah. But uh, I did another interview with Jay Leno on a, a book I had written. I was all excited. I got this interview with Jay Leno for his book club and I called the publisher. I called the editor and I say, I, I think we got a real winner here. And he says, oh, I wish we would have known several weeks ago. We decided not to reprint and we're remanding all copies to Costco. So now <laughs> I, my favorite one, though, and uh, I'll be short, but uh, Judy's kind of gotten used to me when I get into this writing and I get frustrated with all the things the editors want. They nit A lot of times they nitpick things. I'm glad I have an editor, but it it because it does make it easier on one end and harder on the other. And uh, my book, Murder and Mayhem on the Main Street of America, uh, they went through a couple editors at the, at the publisher. And I got this back and said, we need this edited. And there was a whole section, almost two pages, all highlighted. And it said, scrawled across in the margins, it said, too many Germanic phrases. <laughs> and I... I I just jumped out of my chair and I go, what in holy hell are Germanic phrases? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, All part of the adventures. Yeah. I, Jenny, thank you so much for doing this this morning. I hope we've inspired some road trips. I hope we've sold you a few books and uh, that, that I, I hope great. we've encouraged people to, yeah, if you got, everybody's got a story in there. You know, get it out, share it with people, inspire yep. folks or scare the hell out of them when they find out who you really are. But uh, <laughs> self-publish a book. It's it's a challenge. Self-publishing requires a lot of a lot of extra work. But like you said, it's a it's a great hobby and uh, we need to encourage people and we need to encourage uh, road trips. Yeah, we yeah. really do. Yep. Uh, when you say everybody's got a story and every place has got a story too. I, uh, yes. These, uh, I always feel sorry for the people that, uh, you know, drive uh, the interstate across the country and get off the exits with the say route 66 and, and check out three or four hot spots and get back on. Uh, cause all those places in between are pretty cool too. Yeah. Yeah, wasn't it Charles Corral who said uh, the paraphrase that the interstate highway was the best way to travel from coast to coast and see nothing? See, not, yeah, <laughs> something very. Yeah, yep, that was. I believe that was him. Um, he's, he's right. You can you can do that if you want to, but boy, it's... if you take the time, the, the essence and the magic of Route sixty six road trip or US six or fifty or two is to take time to listen. Talk to a waitress, listen to a conversation, eavesdrop, and uh, walk over and talk to somebody. Yep. I have, I've met the most amazing people doing that. I've met uh, Navajo code talkers. Uh, I, I've, I've met uh, people uh, traveling on their 60th wedding anniversary uh, in a, uh, on a Harley Davidson oh, yeah. that, they, that they built. Uh, you, you just find the most fascinating people out there. Absolutely. I'll tell you, the, the worst thing probably about doing that uh, uh, trip in 20 with the, uh, I ate an, a lot more drive through food than I ate on any trip because the restaurants would be closed or limited. Uh, so the bad thing was, uh, you know, I couldn't sit at the diner in the morning and talk to the guy next to me at the counter or at the bar at night and drink a beer with the guy next and talk to him about stuff. It just wasn't, you know, you weren't allowed. You weren't, you weren't in those kind of situations. That, uh, I missed that a whole lot. Oh, gosh, yes. But you did miss an opportunity in that. You could have done what your grandparents did, camp along the road in the swamps and, and yeah. cook over the cook over the fire and see what hobo shows up. And, yep, yep. I, 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 I thought of doing that somewhere, but I talked myself out of it pretty quickly. Yes, God. You know, you mentioned tires and things. Uh, when we traveled, like, say, we always were repairing tires, you know, when I was a kid. Of course, my dad, my dad was funny about that stuff. 
he just never, he would always buy used tires. Always. Even when he was up well up into his uh, early 80s and he could afford to pay cash for a new pickup truck. If he needed tires, he'd cruise the yard sales and find four or five good ones. They didn't have to match. Oh, yeah. And and he set out to drive to Arizona or go see my sister in Alaska. (laughs) Never gave it a thought. (laughs) Uh, I've done that before, but I I got out of the habit. (laughs) Uh, Danny, before we go, you mentioned interesting people and interesting stories. In your adventures, did you get a chance to stop at uh, Uranus Fudge Company? Oh, I did. I've been there uh, two or three times, yeah. Did you ever catch up with Louis Keene? No, I, uh, he, I've never met him. I never, he's either not been there, I didn't go looking, but uh, so no. I, I. Well, he's got a new place a little closer to you now up on uh, in Indiana. Up at, yeah, Anderson, Indiana. Yeah. Um, uh, if, if, if you get a chance to catch up with Louis, oh boy. If you look in the dictionary under a colorful character, it's got his picture. I, yeah, I, I know. I wonder if he. Um, Ever gets over to Indiana himself? I'm sure he does once in a while. Yeah, he's been, he's been fighting a cancer situation, and he's on the re, he's yeah. on the uh, he's getting he's on the road to recovery. But he was in pretty bad shape for a bit. But he's back and forth between the store, stores uh, all the time. Okay, yeah. yeah and, I need uh, to do that. Um, you probably know uh, Pat and Jennifer Brenner Bremer. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, they uh, have been up there a few times and have, have mentioned it. But I they, they live a little closer than I do. So, uh, but it's been on my list. Yeah, he he is just he's just colorful. He's funny. Uh, I, I, my favorite one. I love marketing. I collect automotive advertisement. I have, uh, oh gosh, going all the way back to 1903, 1902. I have hundreds of different kinds of automotive advertisement. Marketing fascinates me. And Louis, boy, he sells everything on the hog but the squeal. That yeah. that boy is just he goes. Uh, my favorite story with Louie is he bought the county newspaper because it was going broke and uh, offered it free to everybody in the county, but he he made it more of a satire thing and a little bit of local news. And he renamed the newspaper the Uranus Examiner. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, Denny, thank you so very much. We need to do this again. Enjoyed it. And, Good time. And if I can help you plan that National Old Trails road trip, uh, give me a holler. Well, and well. Uh, I've got, uh, I'm not sure how I would do it. It's not very big. But maybe I can get this Edsel Ford journal reprinted for you at Staples or something and send you a copy. I'll see if that's feasible. It's a really well, interesting hit. Yeah, yeah. Or, if, uh, or even a you know a, a, an electronic copy or something would be interesting. Yeah. Or, uh, that'd be good. Yeah, because uh, just like with your grandparents' letters, he was very concise, but he wrote a lot about the places they stopped, the visits they made. Um, yeah, I've been lucky on the. Uh, I do have a you know old documentation on the National Old Trails Road, so I'm able to to follow the path of that pretty accurately. Yeah. Um, but the and now I have the one for uh, Pikes Peak, so uh, I'll be able to get the route that I want to follow pretty good. But uh, finding spots along the way is a different story. Yeah. They followed most of the national trails road through Colorado, uh, New Mexico and Arizona into California. That was their primary. And, uh, some of the entries are really funny. Like he's he's traveling in July and, uh, they end up in needles and they end up sleeping on the porch at the hotel, the the, the (laughs) narcissist down there. And he says, you talk about gross understatement. July in Needles, California, he said it was oppressively hot. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <Yeah. laughs> Denny, thank you very much. And uh, we'll do this again next Sunday about seven o'clock and uh, we'll beat our gums a bit, do some visiting and uh, not sure who we got next week, but December 4th, we've got Scott Dahl, the director in uh, the tourism convention uh, visitors bureau in uh, Springfield, Illinois. Got him coming up and got a couple other folks I think you're going to want to hear from. I'm trying to talk Marian Pavel into joining me one morning from uh, Bratislava, Slovakia. Uh, as you know, all this this is uh, like uh, Mayberry Television. We're familiar with Hee Haw. It's like the KORN radio station. We never know how this is going to turn out. Uh, 
But today turned out pretty well. I think we had a good visit. And Danny, I'm most appreciative for your books, for your inspiration, and uh, for joining us this morning. Okay. Maybe uh, I'll see you in uh, person doing the old uh, old road, National Trails. Well, I got a Jeep. We can find some spots. There you go. All right. Sounds good, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys, if you guys are out taking a road trip, there's a couple ways you can enjoy and enhance and keep that time capsule feel. And I've got two suggestions for you. I know we ran a bit long this morning. I hope nobody minds. Uh, but uh, the Roadrunner Lodge in uh, Tucumcari, New Mexico, that is a time capsule, 1964. They, they blur the line between past and present really well. Uh, the other one I highly, uh, you got it. If you do a Route 66 trip or you're in the Ozarks, you really owe it to yourself to, to visit with Connie Eccles and spend the night at the uh, Wagon Wheel Motel in Cuba. It is the uh, oldest continuously operated motel on Route 66 dating back to the 1930s. Uh, I got a bit of a travel schedule coming up, it looks like, uh, December 16th. Apparently, I'm going to be at, unless something changes, I should be at Auto Books, Aero Books, 2900 Magnolia Boulevard in uh, Burbank, California. We're going to be talking uh, road trips. I'll be there with some Route 66 souvenirs and uh, help you with your travel planning a little bit. Uh, planning ahead quite a ways. It looks like I'm going to go to Edwardsville, Illinois for Halloween next year. Uh, the Miles of Possibility Conference, number nine. This promises to be a great event. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, Cheryl uh, Jett, uh, Terry Ryburn, and Debbie Joe Erickson really pour themselves into uh, creating an event. It centers on the history and the business of Route 66, but they always find a way to get some fun in there with some music and other entertainment. That's one you might add to your calendar as well. And uh, you can check out jimhinkleysamerica.com. I have a lot of listings there. Uh, my recommended locations to eat, places to sleep. Uh, we always test the pillows and we always sample the enchiladas. And um, telling people where to go, it's what I do. So you can also find my travel schedule there. Well, my friends, like I say, we ran a bit longer, but you know, that's the joys of having our own program. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we will do this again next week, 7 o'clock. Meantime, how about a little bit of music from Joe, Woody, and the boys of the Road Crew. Roadcrew66.com for some inspirational road trip type music. Until we meet again, my friends, adios. See a load of a new friend on an old road. Take a two lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride, Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America.